Hey guys, Michelle Glass here and welcome back to another episode in our lecture one, chapter one lecture series and our job for this presentation is to tackle three topics just on how to talk about uh, structures in anatomy and physiology. So anatomical terminology is our topic. We're going to start with directional terms, next look at body cavities and divisions, and then finish up with planes. So to begin, as we are talking about directional terms, you want to make sure that you're always relating to your subject, not to yourself. So if you have trouble with that, you know, you can start out initially making sure you're facing the same direction as your subject. Subject means your picture, your model, your patient. Um, and then just remember it's always, you know, the mirror image of yourself. You always are referencing your subject in what's called anatomical position. So if I stand up, anatomical position, you can't really see. Key feature is palms up, hands down at your side, palms up. And that's important because if you feel um, your forearm, you can actually rotate your arm and you'll see that your um, radius will overlap your ulna and your forearm. So you wanna make sure your palm's up so that those bones are side by side instead of one sitting on top of the other. Okay, so I am gonna use this as my delightful diagram. And so you may want to give yourself a minute to draw your delightful diagram. So here, the key thing is you wanna make sure you know which side is your front and what side is your back. So notice I, just put in a little smiley face to help with that. Okay, let's go. All right, first set of directional terms. We have the word anterior or ventral, which is referencing the front, and then posterior and dorsal, which is referencing the back. And really, we, in this course, will use these terms interchangeably. So you can say either anterior or ventral, front, dorsal, or posterior, back. Okay, next we have the top and then the bottom. So the top is superior, the bottom is inferior. Superficial means the surface. And then here would be an example of something that is deep. So the skin is superficial. Um, if you peel off the skin and the layer of fat, the subcutaneous layer underneath, then you get to the muscles which are deep. I also like to think about this in terms of donuts. Does anybody else like donuts? Okay, if you eat a jelly donut, the powdered sugar on the outside would be superficial and the jelly in the middle would be deep. Okay, next we're looking at the terms medial and lateral. The term medial is referencing the midline of the body. So think about your nose, your sternum, your belly button. These are all medial. And then lateral is going to be away from the midline. So this is the edge of the body. So on your head, that would be your ears. On your, um, your shoulder is uh, more lateral compared to your sternum. If you're looking at your hands, remember you're looking at them in your anatomical direction. So when I look at my hand in anatomical direction and I put it down at my body, my pinky, pinky finger is closest to my leg and my thumb is pointing out to the side. So that means that my thumb is lateral and my pinky finger is medial. Now pay attention, these are referencing terms. These are comparison terms. So my nose is medial compared to my eye, which is lateral. But my eye is medial compared to my ear, which is even more lateral, okay? Okay, the next set of terms are proximal and distal. Now these apply just to your appendages. The term proximal means closest to the attachment point. So for the upper appendage, that's the shoulder. For the lower appendage, that's the hip. And then distal means the furthest away from the attachment point. So on the upper appendage, that's gonna be your fingers. And then on your lower appendage, that's gonna be your toes. And then we have the term cranial or cephalic, which is referring to head, and both terms can be used. And then caudal refers to the tail, so for our bodies, that's our coccyx. Okay, 
Next, we're ready to start looking at body cavities. Now, cavities are important structures in your torso. So this is the trunk of your body. Cavities are important in protecting the delicate organs, which are inside um, your torso, also allowing the organs to change size and shape without you seeing those changes in the outside of your body. So you have two major cavities. You have the thoracic cavity, which is at the top, that holds primarily your heart and your lungs. There are a few other structures there, such as your esophagus and trachea is running through there. Um, but these are the key ones. And then you have a muscle called the diaphragm separating the thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavities. The abdominal pelvic cavity is the cavity then that is holding your digestive organs. So you're gonna see your stomach, your small and large intestine, your liver, your um, pancreas, um, also moving down into the pelvic part of the abdominal pelvic cavity. You're gonna see kidneys, ureter, urinary bladder, female reproductive structures would all be in this cavity here. Now you will see that there is a tissue that's lining your cavity, okay? And the tissue that is lining your cavity closest to your body wall is called the parietal serosa. So I've shown that here in blue. Now notice that the heart has its own parietal serosa and the lungs each have their own. And then you have parietal uh, serosa here um, around the abdominal pelvic cavity. And then you have another layer that's closest to the organ walls. And a lot of cases, we'll talk about this as kind of like the outer layer of the organ. So this is gonna be called the visceral serosa. And notice here that I've put that in this pink line right up against like the name of the organ. So right up against the organ. Um, and the term visceral, um, viscera, I always think about this term as meaning my guts. So anything like organ is gonna be referred to as visceral or viscera. So start getting into that habit. Now collectively then the parietal serosa and the visceral serosa compose the serous membrane. So you can refer to the cavities as being lined by the serous membrane. Now typically there's a fluid in between the visceral and the parietal serosa. So that's helping to lubricate um, as these organs move um, or as the body wall moves that's preventing there from being any friction of the body wall rubbing up against the organs or vice versa. Okay, next thing we wanna do is to look at how the abdominal pelvic cavity is organized. Now this is not a natural organization the way thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavity is a natural organization, meaning this is something that humans have uh, developed in order to talk about the anatomy of the abdominal pelvic cavity. So we have two methods of dividing up the abdominal pelvic cavity. Here's the first most simplistic method, dividing the abdominal pelvic cavity up into four sections. So that would make them each a quadrant. And you're using kind of your belly button or your um, umbilicus as your sort of central point there. Now this is more what clinicians will use. So they're going to record, you know, patient was complaining of pain and pressure in the left upper quadrant um, and so forth. And then based on those symptoms, then it helps them to narrow down what might be, you know, causing those symptoms. So you basically have a right and left upper quadrant and then a right and left lower quadrant. And you can use the first letters to um, abbreviate this R-U-Q and L-U-Q and so forth, but you just need to make sure you know what that means. Okay, now remember this is right and left based on your subject or your picture. Not So, you know, keep in mind your reference point to your subject. 
Okay, so next we have more of the anatomist's method for dividing up the abdominal pelvic cavity. And in this case, we're going to have nine sections, so way more specific and specialized than what we did with our quadrants. So this is more to describe, you know, where organs are located and their relationship with other um, organs. So notice it's basically a tic-tac-toe board. And in the center, I'm going to put the umbilical region. So I'm going to start with that. Um, that's basically where your umbilicus or your belly button is located. And so that's pretty easy to remember. Okay, next we're going to have an epigastric region and a hypogastric region. Now the prefix epi means above or upon. The prefix hypo means below. Gastric is belly. So epigastric, I literally translate in my mind, above belly button, hypogastric, below belly button. So that's easy for me to place these in my tic-tac-toe board. Okay, on either side of the epigastric, you have a right and a left hypochondriac region, where here the chondro is referring to the ribs, and so the hypochondriac, hypo again is below, this is below the ribs, okay? And then you have a right and left lumbar region on either side of the umbilical region. So here we're getting into the lower back. And then you have a right and left inguinal or inguinal region on either side of hypogastric. Inguinal is referring to the groin area. So we are basically in that groin area by the time you get to these sections. Okay, so practice your tic-tac-toe board. Make sure you're making sense of what the words mean and that will help you connect those relationships. Okay, the final thing for us to talk about are our planes. So let's kind of make this bigger picture because I brought some clay. So here's my little guy, here's my little guy. So right here I just have a head because I'm gonna do a cut and it's gonna be easier for me to cut just my head versus you know a whole clay body. Okay, so the first plane is a frontal or coronal plane. And so these planes are gonna be important if you're doing a dissection, then you're doing a cut in these directions. And so that helps you understand how to do that cut. Um, if you were doing digital imaging, um, then you're taking, you know, photographs at each of these layers. Your textbook diagrams and drawings and some of the pictures are these different views. So you need to understand what these planes are so you can interpret those images, okay? So if you're doing a frontal or coronal plane, you're basically doing a cut here, separating the front side of the body from the back. So I'm going to take my guy and I'm going to slice him like this on my desk and now I've got my face part and I've got the back of my hair okay frontal or coronal plane all right all right, next we have our sagittal plane. The sagittal plane is your left and right view. So a mid-sagittal would be straight in the middle. Parasagittal would be on either side of that midline. So let me use this guy here. And I tried to put a little eyes and mouth so you can kind of see the front. And so now I'm gonna do my cut like this. So I get left and right sides, sagittal view. Okay, and the last one is called the transverse, the horizontal, um, or the plane, plane. Probably we're gonna see transverse used most often in our materials. So I'm gonna use this guy here. Now I could cut him here, 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 here. I'll just kind of cut in the middle. So in a transverse plane, cross-section plane, you're going to get a top and a bottom. Okay? All right. So that should end us on our discussion here.